Dan Cooper, Masters in Sports Science, PhD student, former Special Air Service Regiment Australia. Do you have the resources available to solve the problem in front of you? Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dan Cooper, a man of extremes. So much so that one of his spare time endeavors saw him single-handedly walk a thousand miles across Alaska on foot, pulling his pulp behind him. He is a 22 year military veteran, 18 years of which was with SASR, Australia's tier one special forces unit. He's also a former strength and power coach for the Queensland Reds rugby team, holds a master's in sports science and is currently completing his PhD. Dan was open to sharing his knowledge gained from his studies, his special forces experience and his time contributing to the human performance cell at SASR. He closely studies how people respond under fear and his answers on this and the psychobiological model of fatigue will surprise and help you do better in any field. We spoke about females entering into special forces, executive performance, toughness and resilience, stress inoculation and cognitive perception. Dan stated that sleep, nutrition, and movement are three keys to resilience. And we spoke about teenagers being undernourished, sleep deprived, and spending so much time on devices that de-evolution is actually occurring. One part I loved was when he spoke about away from goals versus towards goals. These are just a small part of an amazing conversation with a very educated man who really can walk his talk. You can find out more about Dan, his public speaking and how he is helping others at comanche.com.au, that's K-O-M-A-N-C-H-I, and on Insta at The Resilience Lab and Dan Cooper underscore MSC. Links are below, check it out. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, High Performance Living Coach from eatwellmovewell.net. And you're listening to my Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. Subscribe for more amazing tips, interviews, and wisdom from phenomenal guests, and get your free copy of my five day meal plan and exercise ebook at realketonesaustralia.com. This show is sponsored by realketonesaustralia.com, the best and most effective ketone supplement on the market to reduce anxiety, enhance brain performance, and supply twice as much energy as glucose. You can find all my former shows on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Google, Amazon, and Libsyn. Thanks for watching and listening. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. And welcome to my guest today, Dan Cooper. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm so oh, ab- looking forward ab- to this chat. Ab- absolute pleasure. It was, it was great to chat to you just before. You were over in Brisbane. Um, where, what are you doing now? Um, I mean, you've got Comanche. What sort of role are you in now, Dan? Uh, so I've been over in Brisbane for a few years. So at the moment, mostly occupying my time with PhD study. So sort of getting close to three years into that. So that should finish up early next year. Uh, so that's occupying most of my time. Then on the side, I just do a little bit of uh, sort of consulting work just through like the business that I've kind of raised uh, and then that gives me an option once I've, or post study to see where I want to go with the direction I take. So sort of got a few options, I'm just trying to leave it open so I don't get to the end of my study. And then it's kind of like, all right, I need to work something out now. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just a study looking after my kids full time. So sort of stay at home dad study, and then just a little bit of work on the side. Oh, I love how you framed that. I'm going to try and do a little bit of intro, but I, I do like to just find out uh, from the guest, you know, their words about themselves and then I'm going to do um, a, a two-word check-in with you. But uh, for yep. the listeners and the, and the viewers, you know, you served, and please correct me if I'm wrong, 22 years in the military, 18 years in uh, Australian SAS. Uh, you have been a, a strength and power coach for Cleans and Reds. Uh, you've got the Masters in Sports Science we chatted about before slightly. And as you said, you're currently completing a PhD. Is that a, a, a broad brushstrokes background? Yeah, that's pretty much it, sort of close enough. Like, there's some nuances, but I'm not, I don't get excited about specifics and that sort of thing. But yeah, that's pretty much covers it all. Now, the two word, two word chicken. I have to be so careful with my accent. <laughs> Somebody thought I said chicken the other day, but um, I'm going to do this with all my guests now. Um, what I'd, I'm going to ask you is a two word chicken. 
um, using an adjective, uh, two feeling words. How, what's a check-in with you for this morning? Uh, for me, I don't know, you put me on the spot here. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I kind of, it's hard to say, in two words, it's really hard to say. I guess I'm just trying to um, get by today, probably. <laughs> the, I, I hear you, man. Um, Mine's mine's a di bit different today. Mine's um, uh, excited and um, uh, amused, but I'll go into that. But the reason I asked that one, especially with you, is because you said you're a, you're a stay at home dad, and man, that I reckon the the stay at home dad, the stay at home mum, especially that single mum, geez, that some real mental toughness needed there. There's a, there's a lot that goes on, eh? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it was a real change for me at the start because I'd never done it. I think I was actually avoided a lot of it for the first couple of years we had kids to some degree. Um, but then it was just, it was a choice that wasn't too bad. And I was really keen to spend more time with the kids, but um, yeah, it's, it, it gets tough, uh, but it's probably what the most rewarding thing you do, you know, like they're your kids. You want to make sure they get really good outcomes. Um, but you know, like it's, it's something that kind of has, I'm trying to think of a term for it, but like, there's no recognition for it. Like you just put in all this work, raise your kids, and then, but, but everyone does it. So I don't know. I really enjoyed it. And I'm really glad I took the time to do it, to be honest. So I couldn't encourage people to put themselves in a position to spend more time with their kids uh, right. any more than I could. Time. Uh, I learned a thing years ago. Uh, love is spelt T I M E with the family, especially, you know? Yeah. I thought there's a great way of putting it. Um, well, it does transition me into my, I've only got a couple of um, sort of subjects to go down with you today. And the first one was, uh, what uh, did you, what and how possibly did your special forces training experiences teach you? Uh, and I'm going to look at three, three aspects of your life, civilian life, which is very different than 22 years in, in the military, yep. family life, which could be quite in, intriguing here. And then also where your, um, your future and, and, or your endeavors outside the military are business, exploration, adventure, all those things. But just trying to paint a picture for the audience about how you're using that special forces training experience instead of body armor and, and, and a get, actually using the, this uh, for the current life. Um, yeah, I kind of think about that a little bit here and there. And to be honest, if you had asked me a year ago, I'd give you completely different answers on it. Um, so I sort of like, I'm still in this phase where I'm just exploring as much information as I can about human development. So if you are like for now where I'm at on that, as far as we'll start with the adventure. So like the extreme racing I do, uh, so I don't know how much you've sort of looked into that, but the most recent one I've done this year was a thousand miles across the Iditarod trail through Alaska. So it's frozen, it's, uh, pretty much self-supported or semi-supported. So my military training served me really well on that. So I had really big background or history of sort of long duration effort and endurance and that sort of thing. So I could drag us a, a polk for 16 to 18 hours, no problem. Sleep deprivation, yep, covered that for you know two decades. Minimal food, all that sort of stuff, all that uh, I'd done. So I was familiar with that and just pushing through sort of fatigue, exhaustion, just those low points sort of. Um, when you're depleted in mental strength and cognitive function, that, that's fine. So as far as the adventure racing goes, the military set me up for that really well. However, I think with family and then life outside of uh, the military or civilian work, so I don't really separate work and life anymore. Like people talk about work-life balance, but I think you just prioritise one. And wherever you are at that point in time, as to whether you're prioritising work or family. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think in the military, it's work. You prioritize work. Yeah. Because there were times there where like I'd have, well, I got two weeks off when we had our, or both our kids. I would have, I would have loved to have had more time off so I could bond and, and get an attachment with those kids and help my wife and these sort of things. But you got to be back at work. So you're prioritizing work over family there. And then there's birthdays you miss, anniversaries, um, like surgeries that I've missed, all sorts of things that you miss because you're prioritizing work. So for me, that, that's not a balance. Yep. So now that I've left that, what made me really good in that environment to tolerate everything, to perform really well, I think has set me up almost to, um, not for failure, but it's made things difficult on the outside. So in combat, I think 
and there's some research around all this stuff. So soldiers are really good at carpent or compartmentalizing or partitioning their emotion because in combat you kind of have to set certain things aside. But then when you're at home or you're dealing with your kids, they don't want to see that hard, you know, emotionless facade that you've got. So it sort of makes things really difficult there. You've got to move past that so because they need someone that's emotionally available, same as relationships, same as in the workforce. So you can't just go through there like you're some hardened warrior. So I think in a lot of ways I've had to change my understanding, change the way I function and behave so that now I'm getting what my version of success or performance looks like with this environment. So I don't know, like for me, it's a really interesting sort of interplay between some of the skills that serve you really well on the outside and some of the ones that you have to sort of get rid of so that you can perform once you leave the military because they work in the military but they're not serving on the outside or they don't benefit you on the outside yeah i guess if we look at it as a skill set that's correct but then just listening and reading between the lines there as you talk dan what we learn in the special forces is self-analysis analysis uh, um, we debrief each other and and, uh, and self-reflection and you're using that um, real world experience on your current situation and realizing, hang on a sec, I may need to, to cull some of this, may need to add some things in there. So you're actually analyzing your, your current situation in, a, in, a, um, in an outcome-based way as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I also see, I also talk about adapting to environments and that sort of thing, but I've kind of since changed some of the language around that. And definitely whether people bring it within that environment like I think it's it's a nature and nurture thing. Like most things tend to end up being that way and there's, they're multifactorial. So like you learn what performance looks like that environment throughout your special forces career because you just go from all these varied environments and then you might go into another one that's completely contrast and you learn how to perform and get your outcomes or your goals within that environment. So I suppose leaving the military and becoming a dad, becoming uh, a scientific researcher, which was a, a massive change from you know, the, the technical skills I had five years ago. So I guess it, it is just learning what performance looks like in that environment. And I guess some of that is, you know, on the back of 20 years of experience of doing it. So, I, yeah, I guess there are components that I don't consider which are transferring from the military. In particular with um, being a parent, um, my partner Jess just, just looks at me sometimes like I've got two heads when I think this is a normal way and then there's the, the, the classic civilian way, like... Um, uh, oh, this one's this one's a little little story to share. Um, one of we've got a, um, a blended family, so two of her kids and one of mine. Yep. Um, and one of her boys goes to do um, you know the school assembly in front of four hundred people. He had to do a magic trick, and he's he's really good at it. It's really um, uh, well rehearsed. Well, he gets to his um, classroom, and his magic um, trick thing isn't there. He bought a backup. Yeah. That. I had somehow by osmosis taught him. I didn't tell him to. Somehow by osmosis, <laughs> he's got the backup there and he comes home and tells mum, two is one, one is none. <laughs> you know? so, that's not my kids. I mean, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that I will, from my experience, I will try and impart on my kids just yeah. to set them up so they do perform better. Then there's other things which I kind of try and identify about myself that I don't want to see in them. Um, nice. But I guess like you just never truly know how you behave until you see it in your kids sometimes. Oh, that's a true. Pretty a obvious. Great mirror. <laughs> yeah. Well, mate, that's that's um that's really interesting. Um, PhD. What do you, what is you what are you studying? Uh, so the PhD is looking more around human behavior under threat, almost. So it's it's focusing on how you get a training environment, which is essentially got to be have enough fidelity that you, you get. Um, pretty good or you get or you maximize your transfer of training from your training environment to your performance outcomes in a real world environment so it's still looking more around stuff i used to do and i'm not going to go into specifics on it yeah. um but a lot of it is mostly around how you prepare people for to perform in real high threat high consequence environments and then looking at a number of the human factors within that to try and increase that transfer of training so from a sports context it's kind of looking at how you prepare people so that they don't choke under pressure or in competition. So it's kind of what I have found is that it's mostly around how we respond to threat or fear. Interesting. That's um, yeah, that, that opens up so many doors to unpack um, 
I've had, <laughs> yeah. and uh, Professor Nick Gill, um, strength and condition coach, the All Blacks on a couple of times. Yep. Um, speaking about uh, setting those guys up, but of course they the, they work with the sports psychs as well. I'm going to come back to that because that's going to transition into your work. If you're happy to talk about it uh, with the human, yeah, yeah, self. definitely. Um, I'm going to come back to that, but we, we, we've glossed over a couple of things. <laughs> yep. You, you walked a thousand miles across uh, one of the roughest uh, <laughs> terrains in the world. Uh, was that for fun? Was it for charity? Uh, what what drives you to to do such a, a, a epic adventures? Yeah. Why is always the question I get asked around that. And to be honest, I, I've no, I don't have a true answer as to why I do it. I guess it's mostly around fascination and curiosity. Mm-hmm. So it started out doing smaller events and then, I don't know, you could probably relate to the fact that you do an event and then the next one, you have to have a look at the next one and then you have to have a look at the next one. You always need to keep going. Um, and I guess everyone in the special operations community is probably fairly similar. They're always wondering what's over that next hill. Yeah. So I ended up walking enough hills that I'm in uh, the middle of Alaska doing a thousand miles. So it was obviously a big lead up, but it was an event I was really curious about. And also driven a lot around about where my limit exists, both mentally and physically. Yeah. And then pushing to see how close I can get to it. And it's one of those things, I think when you find it, you're probably going to wish you never, you never did, but uh, cause I've got a feeling that's going to be a pretty uncomfortable experience, but I'm kind of just curious as to what people are really capable of. And then, you know, how you prepare yourself, what, the, what are the behaviors and these sort of things that set you up for success in those environments. So I'll keep doing these things as long as my body holds out. Um, but I guess it's more just fascination, curiosity, and just, I guess, seeing that part of the world as well. I was sort of curious as to what life out there looked like in that sort of remote part of the world. I, I actually interviewed a double wood record holder and, uh, last week, Dean Stott, um, Special Boat Service, and he cycled the world's longest road, which was from South America to Alaska. Um, yeah, okay. And just austere environments, all the different ones, and uh, phenomenal um, uh, adventure mindset like yourself. And, of course, everybody's gone, right, he's got the book, he's done this, this world record. And, of course, we're chatting to each other, and he's talking about his next thing, which is uh, kayaking down the Nile. You know, it's, there's always something more to look forward to for the adventure. <laughs> Yeah, I got some ideas. So I'm kind of looking at something in the South Pole, maybe. I don't know. But there's a there's a limit to these things as well because they're all logistically they're fairly big. So like there's a big time financial commitment. You know, and if I'm supposed to be a dad going away for three months, it's probably not ideal at the moment. So I don't know. I've got no time limit on these things. So if, if it comes around, it comes around. If not, that's cool. I can live with that. I, I remember reading Runoff Fines and John Stroud's um, story written by John Stroud, who was the doctor for uh, Tutu SAS at the time. Um, and they that was when they um, self, uh, they hauled their pucks across in Antarctica, um, one side to the other. And geez, they lost like 25 kilos each. Uh, John was doing his um, experiments on the, along the way, um, urinalysis and, and blood analysis. And yeah. a, a did you read that story at all? No, I haven't read it. No, I'm curious as to where this goes. Yeah, amazing book. Um, uh, they did the calculations on how much calories they needed. You know, John's a very clever uh, doctor slash scientist, and um, they had to eat about twelve to fourteen thousand calories. They they either ran out of they they couldn't supply the food as much. They they, they had to ration down a little bit. Long story short, they lost twenty five kilos each. They looked like the, the photos after looked like the concentration camp um, survivors. Yeah. And uh, according to the urinalysis and the blood glucose, they should have been dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but they yeah, kept a, yeah there's a, I'm tracking a couple others that are doing it at the moment. So they're doing a full transverse um, and a crossing can be anywhere. Like it, there's all different routes because you can't just walk straight across. Like there's no, the northernmost point to the southernmost point or east west type thing. Um, and I think, just looking at them, they're tracking about seven, seven and a half thousand calories for their journey over like 70 to 100 days. Wow. Uh, the one I did in Alaska, that took me 26 days. And I just, I was tracking calories just on a, a fitness watch sort of thing. So, you know, they're as accurate as what those things are. Yeah. And it was around five to 7,000 calories a day, depending on how big the day was. I reckon I was probably taking in maybe two or 3,000 at best. I just struggle eating. Sort yeah. of thing. So if I'm going to do something bigger, I've got to, address that so i've got to do more cooking be more deliberate in my eating and that sort of thing because i think i lost maybe 12 kilos over that time period 
Um, but you bounce back pretty quick. And then, as you know, you, like selection, you lose weight. You do like two or three week exercises in the bush or out on ice, you lose weight. So, things. so you're constantly in this fluctuating thing, which I think destroys your metabolism over time. And it's not really that healthy for you, but it's part of the job. Yeah, absolutely. These guys basically end up um, just drinking olive oil soup. <laughs> um, just to try and yeah, get okay. calories in. Yeah, I've heard, because uh, I looked into a little bit of stuff around eating and uh, expeditions have just taken butter sticks to supplement everything or peanut butter, that sort of thing. So I was trying to eat peanut butter, just anything that's high in fat or just yeah. gives you that sort of long, slow energy. Yeah, it's amazing um, hearing the stories. You know, that's a story from 25 years ago that's, it doesn't change. The human, human, um, uh, physiology is the same today for you crossing uh, Alaska as it was for them hauling the pucks. Um, I know you've done some other uh, interesting uh, adventures, journeys. Is there anything else um, that you've you've done that you would like to share with the the listeners and the network? Um, not really. I sort of, I don't know. I try to keep it all fairly varied. So things. So I did like the CrossFit stuff early on, like a lot of people did. Then I've done some ultras, a little bit of Ironman, or not, not Ironman, um, triathlon stuff. But I'm I'm not much of a swimmer, so. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of tend to limit that. Um, and then just the, the ultra endurance stuff. But I kind of like to switch between sort of event types around physiologies. So like for me, it's keeping a good baseline. And then if I want to go and do a strength power thing, I could be, you know, moderately competitive at it or enjoy it without any issues or go do something long. So yeah, for me, I enjoy not specializing in anything, just being able to to do things, whether I'm comp- like really competitive or not, doesn't worry me. It's just going out there and kind of, doing my best at it again listening and reading between the lines is, is kind of like special forces i mean i, I remember before I, I joined um the military even my best friends their their, their parents were um adventure racers um, yep. champions in, in the world back then and um we always wondered what why didn't why don't the navy seals just go in and kill it you know <laughs> um the sf has to train in so many um train and stay current in so many different um uh, genres that you just can't be that specialist of that 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 high end and that's kind of what you're saying now you're the all-rounder strength power endurance and and it's about just that experience yeah yeah i know a couple of guys here that went into uh, um, a multi-sport sort of race it was like five days or something they actually did really well but they turned up and just hide everything so you have these plastic high canoes going down the river where everyone's got you know these high speed setups. Uh, and I think they did all right. I think they got lost or something happened on one checkpoint sort of thing. It's just that lack of experience in these sort of things where they were sort of just learning on the fly, yep. um, but still did really really well because they got the ability to continually push. Like they will push to the limit and keep going, and they're hugely competitive people. Um, so yeah, I reckon most of them would do really well if they just had took that little bit of time just to take their sort of high level of general ability and then just did a little bit of specific training. They'd probably be pretty competitive or do pretty well at it. Yeah, I completely agree. The learning curve, you know, what I learned in, in the special forces was, you know, you, you get to see something once and then you just replicate it. You can do it, you perform, you know, te- teach it once to the to the student and then they're away. And the learning curve is, is like that. Um, uh, it's absolutely brilliant, that, that mindset of people that get chosen. Um, I, I'd just like to go back to, one last thing of the civilian side and then maybe even talking about um comanche and then we'll go into the human performance uh, cell yep. um a new zealand sas guy bill bestick um he he had a great career in the in the unit um went on to become a doctor and went on to become uh, here in australia an anesthetist um so a, a high degree of training but I remember when he uh, was talking on on a show and he was on as a helicopter paramedic. And when they got to the incident, it was his first time, nobody really knew him uh, apart from the pilot. Um, He started like delegating and and telling in the army way, you know, (laughs) you do this. And it just wasn't a good outcome. Um, They were very resistant to it. And afterwards, these people with minimal experience compared to him, um, we're saying, oh, you know, you you sort of essentially rubbed them. They, they got rubbed up the wrong way and they didn't like being told things. He reflected and went, okay, I've got to learn to communicate um, with civilians differently. So next time it's like, okay, look, I'm sure we can all agree. This guy's here. We should, we need to do this, this, and this. And he's, he's being quite collaborative. What I'm getting towards, Dan, is speech with civilians. 
this is more for the for the veterans who are listening. Um, how did you find your change of communication style once you left the military, in particular left the special forces? Yeah, I th- honestly, I think I was lucky here. So for some reason, I never got, I always resisted being indoctrinated in, in the military way. I think so. Like I, for all my peer group in special forces, they were all like two to three rank levels above me. So like I had no ambition to go through and get leadership roles or anything like this. Like I went down a different pathway where I did all the academic research and well, so the academic study anyway, so I was off doing subject courses, I was at uni, so I think so. Um, and then I was only in the sort of regular military for probably three and a half to four years. And I was at the lower rank, so I wasn't talking to anyone anyway. I was just being told what to do, going around just as the shit kicker. And then you get into the special operations and it's more personal skills there anyway. Like you develop the relationships and because you're in small teams, there's like six people, you know, there's you got your person in charge, the two I see, and then you guys are doing it. So when you are talking to people below you, it's a conversation anyway. Like for me, it was always, you know, not telling them, but asking them and they know that it's got to get done. So like, there's no issues there. And I never really worked with anyone that I had huge personal, personal clashes with. Like it, it happens. Most people are professional enough not to let it worry them at work. They just don't hang out with each other outside of that. Yeah. So it was, kind of always just at a personal level there i didn't really have to use authority or dictate or anything like that um so then when i left i went into sport i suppose the transition was a little bit because i was starting to do the university stuff and looking at coaching and then my wife owned a gym so i was doing a little bit of work there i kind of went from the military interactions to just almost small steps really just a few uh, sessions here and there with my wife and sort of you know I was in there a lot so I was watching her coach anyway sort of thing so you're just seeing a different way of doing things and then when I left I went into sort of sport where it's still sometimes you've got to tell people to do things sometimes it's just asking them to do it I always prefer to ask because I'd like to I would prefer somebody to be motivated to do the right thing by them than to try and use some sort of compliance based or sorry or to try and get compliance for them to do it sort of thing. So rather than make them do it, I'd rather they just were motivated to do it. So I guess that kind of helped me transition out, which is the fact that I I never became hard military type of leadership. So that's kind of served me well, I think. In the military, I I completely understand how it gets that way because you've got larger groups that need to do things as they're told, when they're told, because like you've got big, big hands maneuvering things. So you need people doing as they're directed. I guess one of the things that kind of um, reinforces that is when we we're parachuting. So I was in three hour after a little bit, para- like the airborne regiment, you got round ships that you can't really steer. Yep. And everyone's like, oh, I wish we could steer them so that we didn't land in trees and whatever <laughs> else you land in. And then someone points out, do you really want 300 people in the air steering all in their own direction whenever they want? Or do you just want them all moving in the same direction? So I was like, it right, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. If we're all moving in the same direction, then we're more harmless to each other. So I get how the military or why the military does it, but for me, it was just something that I never really got indoctrinated into. So it sort of eased a lot of the transitioning um, difficulty. But yeah, when you're in a civilian environment, you just can't talk to people like that. Like they just, they don't tolerate it. They respond differently to it. And you become like almost a bit of a dictator in their eyes. So it's probably uh, a two part thing where you've got to learn that they don't respond like that. And then just kind of hope or just, tell them you know I've, I've got a bit of work to do here just c- come with me on this and then you know they're a little bit more understanding that you're going from whatever it was environment you're in to being more appropriate within that environment you know like these are always two-way streets i feel yeah that's that's a good uh, a good answer yeah bringing them along on the journey i i think is so important and yeah like you said they don't respond <laughs> it's something that <laughs> and, and you said transition you eased into that transition and uh, I was, who was I talking to? I was talking to one of the, one of the guests. I think it was uh, Dean Stott again last week about transition. You know, when I was in the army, I thought it was like, okay, transition means I finish work on the Friday in the army and Monday I'm going to pick up the job and that's my transition done. You know, <laughs> transitions are a very unlinear and, and long journey, I think. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot goes on in that transition, you know, and I think it just depends on what you go into as well. So from the military into sport, it was an easy transition because I was fairly similar environments. And I think I probably pursued a similar environment anyway, just like that's how uh, how I'm intuitively driven. It was something I was interested in, but it's an easy one to go into. But then going from that to parenting, like that's, that's chaos. Like I just got turned on my head and 
children dictate to me. Like I'm those kids dictated to me for a while. And then you're trying to work out, you know, what day to day routine looks like with them. So that was probably a much bigger transition, but you know, I've got a lot more skin in the game. So that one I'm going to make work. Uh, it's so worth it. You said before, actually, and I, I did gloss over a little bit. You said you don't get any recognition. Well, the recognition is little, but it's, it's a golden <laughs> moments with the kids, isn't it? That, that you yeah, see yeah, yeah. That unconditional love. Yeah. And I guess if you're in special operations, recognition is not a big thing anyway. So um, like I, I certainly can empathize and sympathize with a lot of parents out there that are under-resourced, are working to the absolute maximum trying to get these kids to where they need to go sort of thing. And you know, no one is really offering them any help or anything like that. So like I think it's one of those things where you don't really need recognition um, because you just see your kids prosper and that's enough for it. But yeah, yeah like it's just something that mo- honestly most people will do. It's pretty tough and it's just something that you kind of have to work your own way through. And so on that, I was just listening to a scientist a couple of days ago, um, women's brains, this this may be of interest and it will transition to the human performance side. Uh, um, women who say on the corporate ladder before they um, give birth, you know, that, that's the, their focus. All of them, as soon as they give birth, their their mindset, not mindset, sorry, that something shifts mentally. And um, yeah, they're now no longer um, job and career focused, they're now baby focused because literally that's uh, evolution. Yeah, yeah, that would make complete sense. Um, I've seen some stuff as well that shows with men, um, once they start a family or they've had a couple of kids, they release more oxytocin and they become more empathetic. So it changes. So from pre-family to post-family, you've got yeah. men who probably the hardened edges have been softened a little bit. Not all, obviously some of them kind of still need some work to do. Yeah. Um, but for on average and all your research looks at it on, on average anyway. So um, yeah, on average, it's kind of, cha- there's some changes at the cognitive level in men as well in the hormonal neurotransmitter side of things. That's interesting. And, uh, Christian Thibodeau, a guest on the show, and and a couple other people around that um, have have concurred. Uh, psychology, uh, sorry, biology creates psychology. So just yep. as you're saying there, you know, you said some some big ten dollar words, as the Americans say, oxytocin <laughs> changes and so on. But the the output is they look like psychology. Oh, they're a bit of a softer person, a bit more loving. But that biology creates psychology. It's, it's not so much the other way around. Yeah, yeah, like a. And we're probably going to get into this, but the cognition, emotion, physiology, just the interplay as a person, like really fascinates me. Um, and like, there's so much good science out there that indicates that, yeah, we're not like a we we isolate sciences for the purposes of qualifications and academics, but like we're a, a sort of a very complex individual moving mm-hmm. through a complex environment. Yeah, complex. Dan Pronk uh, with a, the the. No, not just Dan, sorry, obviously, uh, the, the three authors of Resilience Shield, they explained what that word was so well. And, and I'm not going to steal the thunder. If whoever's listening, go get the book. It, it transitions perfectly for um, for what I'd like to speak to you about now. And I've been, I feel I've been holding you back so much with the, with the, with the leash there because you, you, so, you seem passionate and wanted to get out there all this good information you've learned. You Human performance cell at Australian SAS. Could you please talk us through the origins of that, your input, and and then um, where you're going to uh, using that now? Yeah, so I guess like my piece in that was just one component of it. So I'll just talk to my stuff. Uh, I don't know all the lane ways that the other people that did it took in there. I just know the point that we all sort of met up yeah. at the intersection of that. So like for me, I was always interested in uh, physical performance. So like once I got into the regiment, I think I weighed around about 78, 79 kilos. And I sort of, I struggled under a lot of weight on selection. I got into the regiment. One of the first things I did on the weekend was going out and bought a book or whatever book I could find around training. And back then, I think it was Arnold Schwarzenegger's Muscle Building Encyclopedia. Um, oh, I've got the same one. I spoke to a guest about it. It's, it was my Bible back in the, in the old school days. <laughs> yeah, early 2000s, it was about four books. It was about four people writing books and they were all from the bodybuilding world. So... Uh, and to be honest, it served me well for what I needed at the time. So I just need to put on size so I can get a bit bigger and a bit stronger. So I just went, read through that. Then I started my own physical training. So just to try and make sure that I could tolerate the loads that we were carrying and then mm-hmm. still survive without getting injuries. And then over the years, our job roles trained or changed a little bit. 
And I sort of noticed that there was a lot of people getting hurt. And then sort of high intensity fitness started coming in, I think sort of 2006, 2007 or so. Yep. And then I sort of took an interest in that. And I came across uh, Tudor Bomper and sports science and sort of periodization. I got really interested in that. And then I sort of proposed a, a plan where I went to go or I'd go to university, start studying in sort of exercise sports science. And then I'd bring that information back in to try and improve the way we we're doing our, our physical training because it's just what we're doing to me could be better. Yep. So there was an agreement that that was a pretty good idea. If I self-funded it, they'd provide me the time I needed to go to university. Uh, work still had the priority. So there were some periods there where I was sort of pretty hectic doing work and uni at the same time. Did my undergrad, started feeding that back in and then I did a master's, which was all um, external. So that was online and that was about a year and a half. So I went through that and that was all weekends nights wow. that sort of thing and i just became really efficient at listening to lectures while i was driving the car or exercising or this sort of thing so i was just found other it was one of those things i learned what the success looked like within that environment so i'm still working doing that and that was kind of around the same time the human performance cell started growing so it started as an initiative there was some information coming back from overseas about the way they were raising them but they were using more of a sport model where they just got really good strength and conditioning coaches they came in and just took control of their programs and they had some green rolled people there just working with them so they could sort of both work out what this looked like. We didn't really have the ability to get contracts. So there was another, I don't know if you come across Harry Moffat at all. Yeah, um, um, but I he, don't know him, but um, his book was amazing. Yeah, yeah. So he was looking at the psychology side of it uh, and then it would have been around 2010, 2011, I think. Uh, I, still i think second or third year and he was probably a little bit further ahead on psychology but it's a much longer pathway yep. than that then we sort of came together uh, and then there was i think two others and formed this initiative and then that kind of just slowly grew over time into what it is now so after a while army took over they start doing sort of resourcing it putting a little bit more money in it and then it's kind of grow i think it's still got a long way to go before it's a really mature program because it's still reliant on the the military fitness training side of things where I think um, there's the RAF are starting to get sport scientists in and starting to get contracts. So as far as knowledge of the principles and the science behind it, they're ahead, but they're more of a, a sedentary uh, environment compared to sort of infantry or some of your combat roles sort of thing. So yeah, I think of course. there's still a way to go. And what that looks like is up to them. So sort of thing. so we just kind of kicked it off knowing that it was one of those things where you're going to plant a seed that you'll never see that tree. So we just sort of did what we could hand it over and then somebody else takes it forward. And then on the, I did a master's of research looking at integrated cognitive and physical training. And that was supposed to be within the military, but that's when I transitioned out to the Queensland Reds, took a job there as their assistant strength and conditioning coach. And then just did that research with a rugby team. Can you no, just elaborate? That. You said integrative cognitive. I just want to get that down as, as, as correct. Yeah. So it was working off um, the uh, psychobiological model of fatigue. So Samuel oh, wow. Makora, I think, is the, the original uh, researcher involved in that. So it works a little bit off. I don't know if you've come across Tim Noakes' Black Box Theory, where there's like a central governor that when you uh, get to yes, a certain uh, point, uh, uh, just the, kind of um, limits your output. Who was that doctor and professor, the, the um, South African? Yeah, Tim Noakes, I think. Tim Noakes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just looked at that. So there's some other stuff out there, but I'm not interested in that. Um, so yeah, it kind of progresses on that. And I haven't read all of that research. I just read a bit of it. But then the psychobiological model just looks at perception of effort and perception of fee, uh, fatigue. And I looked at a few, there's some other research, and I can't remember the researchers' names. That was looking at how we mentally or cognitively go about pacing strategy. So we look at how far we've gone, what it's cost us, how far we perceive we've got to go, how much energy we think we can uh, put out to get there. And then that is our pacing strategy. And that's constantly updated. So there's this constant interplay between how we feel, how far we've gone, how, how uh, well we perceive or what energy output or power output we perceive we can do to get to the end. And then there's all this information that I've looked at that's uses sort of slow running clocks where they'll tell somebody it's a four minute time trial, but the clock's actually six minutes. And then they do the same output for six minutes that they would do for a four. Wow. I just became really intrigued in this whole cognitive perception piece. And then I did some research around it that shows that you can change perception 
through uh, some working memory tasks while you're doing your physical training. Oh, wow. That sounds but, intriguing. Yeah. Just how practical it is, is the other question. Because in the lab, this stuff works, but like it's so monotonous out in the training, people just aren't going to do it. So right. okay, it's definitely a perceptual thing there. And then the other question for me was, because in elite performers, the impact of cognitive fatigue doesn't influence their perception of power output. So they just do the same power output. Where if you get amateurs, just say you did a math task before you put them onto a physical task, their power output goes down, regardless of energy availability. Like even if you did muscle biopsy, nothing, there's no indicators of fatigue, their power output just drops because cognitive and physical fatigue uh, are intertwined. So I started thinking a little bit around, well, if you could just develop that attitude, then off you go. Like if you're happy just to hurt a little bit more, then you'll develop the capacity to tolerate that pain. So theoretically, most of your special operators or special forces environment probably are working at that high end perception anyway because they're just happy putting the sword to themselves when it comes to physical effort <laughs> i gave it i give an example uh, we're not right in the head i say to people when i remember one time we were doing a recovery run so you said about um exercise science coming in it's we're the same in the unit 2005 is when i got in and up to then it was the army pti's but we had a a, a uh, actual decent strength and conditioning PTI come in and, and it started to become intervals and, and crossfitting and sewing, so, so on. But uh, we had a long story short, we had a recovery run uh, around the around the um, the unit uh, base. We're in a civilian, uh, just like Swanbourne here, surrounded by uh, city houses. It's just a five k recovery run, and and Scotty and he's been on the show, so can easily say his name. He said, "Okay, guys, look, just take it easy. It's recovery. You know, we did this yesterday, and we got this today. And it's the whole squad in there." And we just go out jogging, have a nice chat. And one guy, that one guy just wants to push himself. He didn't, he wasn't going to race anybody else. He just wants to push himself. And the next thing you know, you got the whole squad of guys doing a four and a half K sprint to the end. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we used to joke about it. He's like, oh, today's just going to be light run 5K. He's like, no, it's a 5K race. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it was never easy. Um, but on that as well, like I, I talk about, the army's still got a long way to go. And like by no means is that uh, on the PDIs themselves. So they're like you said, that depends on what they're interested in, what mm. they bring sort of thing. So, but, but we did have one who was, uh, had a very um, long background in powerlifting. So I think that was early 2000s and I've never been exposed to powerlifting. So that was my first introduction to actually true strength work. Mm -hmm. um, and I, re I took a lot away from that sort of thing, but then he left and then a runner comes in. So now, We've got a running focus sort of thing. So it just depends on, you know, what they've had access to as far as knowledge, education, that sort of thing, and their interests. It really does. Um, our runner, our running PTI, um, <laughs> we do um, body armor and gas mask run. And of course the PTI is in his shorts with his body armor and, and gas mask. But we put a tea bag between the, uh, the gas canister and his, and his mask. <laughs> so he's sucking through this filter and, so, fuck, this is hard. And he's, he's fit as hell. He's way fitter than any of us. So, why is this so hard? And he rips his mask off and doesn't has a look and realizes we tried to suffocate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, with the human performance cell, I mean, you're running uh, Comanche um, and a couple other other endeavors, what business wise, and and how are you using that now uh, in the civilian world? Uh, so the stuff I'm doing now, um, I've only just started in the last couple of years. So I moved away from the, the human performance side of things. So I kind of went back more into the green mile stuff. Uh, just there was a shortage of people in the, the streamline I was in within special operations. So I went back to doing mostly green mile stuff. And then uh, a few other people took over the physical side of things. And then when I went into the reds, I did the two years there. And that was kind of the last of my emphasis on physical conditioning. So I'm not really using a lot of that anymore. Yep. I've done a little bit of work trying to help prepare a few females for special forces or for that selection process. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done in that space, but there's definitely a lot of potential as well. Um, and, and I think the question really is what should that look like? Because there's a few, few Northern European companies that are doing it, or countries that are doing it really well. And they've just taken a slightly modified approach to it because that's one thing where there is physiological differences that kind of are limitations. Uh, so I was, did all that. And then when I started study is when I sort of started raising the business side of things I've got and just looking at kind of a little bit of work on the side because my, 
a student income at the moment. So I, do, I went from sort of special forces team leader into sport and then as a scholarship student. So it's just a little bit of paying my bills really at the moment and doing a little bit of work and just seeing what from my research and experience and that sort of thing translates into executive performance or into some of these other things where I'm working. Um, and so far, a, a lot of it translates really well. I completely agree. Um, you, actually, we didn't speak about it earlier, but um, uh, Nick Caldwell from the Mill Gym here in Perth. Yep. Uh, one of the the most, you know, it, sure, he's got a, a CrossFit style gym and we actually interviewed him and, and, and Joe. It's really based on the Jim Jones um, uh, gym programming from way back in the day. And, and then they've got the, the other programs that for the uh, the wannabe SF uh, SWAT operators and so on, but where he really excels is the mindset stuff. Um, the these executives, higher performing civilians, just tapping into that mindset that um, he can um, uh, talk to and give examples of. And yeah, I can definitely see how what you're doing is going to lead into executive performance as well. Yeah, there's definitely. A huge need for an opportunity like even like you think about school kids or the next generation is that they're already anxious so by the time they go into business like asking them unless somebody intervenes and they get some really good skills but them making multi-million dollar decisions in a few years this is going to be or in a decade is probably going to be problematic for them. like that's a stress they've never been exposed to so for me like that side of things is only going to get bigger and um, like I haven't come across some stuff today, which was talking about uh, trigger warnings or content warnings, these sort of things that we see all the time now that, that they actually prime people for stress. Like the research shows that they either have zero effect whatsoever and they're neutral or they have a negative effect, but they're definitely not having any positive effect. So for me, the more mentally strong or resilient people you can get in front of people, but you are going to pick up some of that attitude you're going to pick up some of their skills and these sort of things. And that's going to give you more positive outcomes when it comes to dealing with stress, because ultimately from all the research I've done and everything I've looked at, it's exposure. That's yeah. the number one factor in building resilience. And if you think about it, similar to an aerobic capacity, like you can't avoid running and expect to run a marathon when it happens. So it's going out there progressive or appropriate um, dosage that's progressed to your ability is going to go get you from where you are to where you want to be or build that tolerance for sort of stress or threat response. Well, wow, that's really intriguing. Like I did, I did my research on you, but I wanted to keep it very um, broad brush strokes and see where we go. But, you know, I've, I've just come off the back interviewing uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman yep. and that published last week, um, stress inoculation, um, a little bit of resilience uh, and literally that exposure and how without the exposure to that stress, um, the soldier, but more importantly, really for the world is the police officer can't, um, can't pull that trigger and, and save someone's life or save their own. Um, uh, Pup Johnson, he, his show will release soon, New Zealand SAS, he uses nature um, to improve toughness and resilience in, um, yep. in young people, possibly in young soldiers that he's taken through. And that's, again, that stress inoculation. And I think it was him that said, or maybe it was Dean Stott, you can't be experienced without experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but even to the point that, because ultimately a lot of my stuff is, it's all fear. Like, that's what I'm looking at, is how people respond under fear. And if you're familiar with the threat, then the impact of it is reduced or you have a higher tolerance to deal with it. But it's contextual as well. So experience doesn't necessarily give expertise either so you get experienced in the environment that you're working in there may be far transfers for something so that they go across domains but a lot of them seem to have especially when it's threat related is it's near transfer so you just become familiar with the threats that you're dealing with within your environment right so this again is where a huge varied exposure to different things is going to build that baseline capacity and then in a new environment, you'll learn what familiarity is with those threats. And then the more familiar are, the lower the impact or the emotional and cognitive impact it has on you and the better your performance. Because a lot of what I look at is police as well. Like that's where most of the research is. So yeah, I'll sort of, of 
been looking at that a lot and a lot of that's around use of force um and the risk there is because they're becoming well they're reducing all their fitness standards as well so one of the components with that is you have to perceive you've got the resources available to solve the problem in front of you so right. if you have low aerobic capacity or low strength because they reduced their entry standard because they just need more people and society shifting backwards is that if you get into uh, and a lot of it's use of force as far as like physical restraint all these sort of things all the way up to non-lethal and lethal for um uses is that if they're in a, a wrestle and they, they're running out of energy their perception that they can solve this problem is reduced or they're confidence or competence in their ability to solve it is reduced so they've got to escalate their levels of force to yep. survive this interaction so you risk more inappropriate use of force by having people that have lower physical ability and have lower exposure to threat because they're just not familiar with it either absolutely and we get into that sort of threat or negative bias where we will perceive a threat is much higher than what it is yeah so it comes back to perception but also um so the threat was one their perception of threats changed, but also physically the threat has now changed because they are only operating at a certain capacity of what they could physically do to overcome the force um, that's being used against them. Yeah, and it's not, you know, Dan just saying the police have lowered their standards. All over the newspapers here in Western Australia is the police lowered and it showed the standards they had to lower to get to get more people in. Um, yeah what a, a great practical example of that um and yeah. and fear rises and of course that's a that's a self perpetuating thing is the fear goes up the adrenaline goes up the heart rate goes up and then everything else goes down and then all they want to do is is pull the trigger to save their own life yeah yeah well fitness and strength are sub factors of resilience like they're they're not causal but they're definitely associated to it like the higher fitness the higher strength the more resilient you have and there's a, a whole number of mechanisms behind that um, but like for me, resilience, the three big factors of it or mental strength, however people want to define it, fortitude, whatever it is, um, is sleep. Like if you're not getting sleep, then you're cognitively compromised and everything becomes a problem because ultimately all we want to do is survive the day to get to tomorrow. Yeah. So if you're down on sleep, you have to avoid more to survive. So sleep is the biggest one. Then nutrition, because you need energy. Everything's about energy. You need enough energy to solve your problem. And then it's movement. So physical um, movement, whatever that is appropriate. And then when you look inside the physiology, strength seems to be more important than aerobic capacity for a number of factors. When you're talking about longevity, strength is, has higher associations to living longer. Yep. Uh, and that's potentially around some of the hormone factors later in life, because if you're maintaining muscle mass, you've got a better hormone balance. So like getting our kids to move more and play more and do more things is going to have nothing but positive benefit, which flows into all these occupations which are now reducing their standard around physical requirements because we've got a lower percentage of our community that is capable at the current standard so that if everyone's drawing from the same pool you've got to reduce your standard at the moment or find a better way to prepare them on the way in and then on the way through that part i, I love um as i said before we started recording i had heston russell his show at least soon and he's talking about um Imp improving the the national spirit and so on because the the current generation is not really being taught so we don't blame that so he's trying to um, empower that but i interviewed the sergeant major of the army um, new zealand army um a while back and being a sergeant major and having access to so many people around the world he stated that our generation um say, say we had um 20 year old uh, children then yep. their bone density in this generation only is 20 percent less than us simply because they're not skipping and jumping out of trees like we used to. Uh, yeah. And then throwing a grenade and slash ball, they can't throw as far, they can't meet that grenade standard. So instead of us going, well, that's society, why not take ownership of that and then uh, layer those, the, give those um, kids the tools to, to progress really well. Yeah, and like the, if you look deep enough, you'll find all sorts of research on, on all the markers are down. Like mm. I think it's, I looked at it a little while ago, but in 18 year old men or boys, like I, I, I wasn't a mature adult until I was probably 30. So um, no disrespect to them, but <laughs> like their testosterone level 
I would have higher testosterone than the average 18 year old at the moment. So their testosterone is lower than a 40 year old from the eighties. Yep. Like it's, it's huge decreases in testosterone in young boys. And that's multifactorial, but that's associated to, you know, less time outdoors playing, less physical activity, less sleep, all these sort of things. They're playing, they're staying up all night playing games. They don't see as much sun, all these sort of things, but there's literally every marker you look at obesity is up. They're down on the amount of, nutrition they're getting so the amount they're actually eating the required amount of fruit and vegetables meats these sort of things sleep is down none of them are getting enough sleep physical exercise every marker i look at is down and it's all just having this huge impact and that, i think that's why you're seeing so much anxiety it's a result of behaviors that we've allowed children to develop or as parents we've kind of just put in there because it's easier to put your kid on a device than it is to actually control their behavior yeah and that's what we're seeing is this sort of almost de-evolution in humanity at the moment in western cultures i i completely agree and it goes back to the, but it also goes back to that an analogy that quote you gave with the, the the police officer do you have the resources available to solve the problem in front of you you know translate it to an 18 year old uh, kid who is sleep deprived has been up all night has been uh, not outside playing and then a stressful situation comes across them um, they don't have the resource available simply again through the biology. Um, yep. It's not, and then we think it's a psychological thing. I'd like to just finish off and, and try and tie this in a bow because you, you're yep. very um, uh, diverse. Is you, you stated really what your study is how people respond under fear, and I, I had Tony Blower on. You know, literally, that's this his his life's work is, is fear response. Yep. I'd like to find out from you. How do people respond under fear? Oh, that's essentially they avoid it. Like it's a, it depends. There's a lot going on, mm. but ultimately they'll avoid whatever it is in front of them because one, it's, it's uncomfortable. They don't want to deal with it. One, they don't perceive they've got the capacity to deal with it, um, but they will literally almost go into like a, an avoidance based behavior. Uh, and mm -hmm. kind of you see it in a lot of things a lot of people that think they're pursuing goals are almost avoiding a discomfort um, mm -hmm. so like the fitness industry is a really good one for it so the majority of people that goal set in there is around sort of aesthetics so most of them want to look better in a swimsuit and we're coming into summer so there's probably gyms all over australia where people are in there trying to get abs but that's not a towards goal that's an away goal because they don't want to feel uncomfortable like they did last year and their right. behaviors have been pretty slack through the winter. So there's a bit of work to do. So a lot of that is more around avoidance of an uncomfortable feeling. And that's a low level fear, almost. They fear going to the beach or going out with their peer group and you know, almost feeling ashamed in themselves or whatever that feeling is. And then even in the gym with, you know, when we had a gym, a lot of guys were in there trying to chase certain strength markers. But again, that's not because they want to be that strong. It's because other people are that strong and they don't want to feel sort of, whatever that negative emotion that they've attached to it. So they want to get strong to avoid unco that uncomfortable feeling. So like that's a low level fear almost. And then it goes up to, you know, whatever it is that you're willing to tolerate. You know, you look at even COVID was an excellent example that under fear, people will give away their autonomy. So you just give up, especially if, if you've never fought for freedom, you'll never respect freedom. So people that have just had it gifted to them, under fear they just hand it over because they want somebody to take control and get rid of whatever this is in front of them that they're afraid of so like the the behaviors vary but yeah. when you start to understand it you can look out and you can see all a whole heap of behaviors and again this may just be me cognitively priming myself to go out and look for what it is i'm studying because that's an easy way to you know join dots within the world and, and yeah. maybe they don't even exist i don't know but like it's fascinating uh, there's a, a quote from Tony, uh, fear is a reflex, courage is a, is a choice. Yep. Um, that, that's not being blasé or giving a throwaway um, uh, catchphrase. Uh, the book Natural Born Heroes by Chris McDougall um, is a phenomenal book, um, mainly about Crete. But he looked into, um, you know, why does the everybody else out there in the street not respond to that person being assaulted, but the grandma did? That's exactly what you said. Most people would just avoid fear. They 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 perceive they don't have the capacity to stop that person from being uh, stabbed or hurt. And then the grandma went this way, chose courage, and 
and with disregard for herself, just went, okay, I'm going to figure out how to fight and, and did on the day. Um, it, courage is a choice. And that's why I got you on here. Uh, you know, using your special forces training experiences, obviously combined with your, your education uh, to help others. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing watching human uh, psychology for sure. Yeah, yeah. I've, I haven't never spoken to Tony. I've never done any of his stuff, um, but I've kind of listened to him on a lot of things. So like my my perception or my take on it, uh, and I could be well wrong. So um, I'm I'm open to feedback if I am wrong on things, because uh, he's in the very much in that close personal space. Mm. He does talk a lot about the uh, startle response and these sort of things. Um, yeah. And in the research I'm looking at, it probably goes out a little bit longer as to proximity of the threat mm. as in both distance and time because they seem to be important so the closer you are it's more of a starter response uh conditioned reaction or a response like a reflex sort of thing and, yeah, and, and, have... and on that uh, one one thing he likes to speak about is majority of people that have gone through car windows which isn't so much anymore but they now end up with, with the airbag burns they they always get damage on the front of their arms yeah so yeah, that yeah. physical um, flinch startle reflex you're speaking about is, is 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 literally what you said is push away you know avoid the avoid the uh the thing yeah and if you go up to a baby and just flick your fingers in its face like it'll startle because it's it's a natural protective response like there's research that shows that a bug flying out of some, or like a motorbike helmet the eyes will shut without ever realize without consciously being aware there's a bug there like it's but there is there's a couple of different visual pathways to our threat response system and one of them is just a direct straight line from the visual system to the threat mm. response. And it, it does things that we're not even aware of. Mm. Um, but the, I look a little bit further out where it's a conditioned response and you can try an inhibition of that response in there. And then you've got a little bit more time where you're making decisions. So like when you're talking about the courage piece, until you become aware of the threat and you, and whatever time frame that is, it could be tenths of the seconds, hundreds of the seconds, it could be, three or four seconds, depending on your exposures and these sort of things, that's when you like, you are comfortable with the fact that this may not go as well as you plan, but you are happy to take action. Like, you know that you need to take action. And that's a lot of the military stuff is you'll see guys, first gunfight, there's a, a little bit of a pause where they're kind of what I would hypothetically call orienting from the literature, where they're kind of taking in more information to work out, okay, what's really going on here. They just want more information before they make a choice to act yeah. in a specific way. Then people who are are really experienced they're picking up that pattern straight away so they're straight into action yeah and they're, they're they've overcome that fear because i think a big part in that environment is almost reconciling your own mortality that you know what you made a choice to be here you may not leave the battlefield but you're going to do everything in your power to get not only yourself through it but everything everybody else so a lot of people will lift and just do what they need to do and there's you know years of conditioning and experience and these sort of things that go into that um but yeah like until you are comfortable with that threat and you get to that point where you're consciously aware of it that's when you over you can override fear and again that's oversimplifying it yeah uh, look you're you're a wealth of knowledge it's so in depth and like i said uh, 20 minutes ago i've been holding you back on the leash for from exploding all that stuff it is is absolutely fascinating um thank you for for sharing all your knowledge and and uh, and your experience. And I'm glad that yeah you know, we went a different tangent than than the other shows you've been on because I want I really wanted to to focus on that with you. Um, so what's next for Dan? You, you spoke about Antarctica. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm interested in the South Pole. That's just something I've always been interested in. Um, like I was trying to get a, a RAF flight when I was in the military. I had no reason. I was just trying to find a way to get down there for a day. <laughs> um, and if I didn't have kids, I probably or family, I probably would apply to go down for one of the six to nine months sort of rotations that they do down there over the summer at the the research station. Yeah, I don't. It's just always fascinated me. Um, the next day or next best way to do it. It's probably not best or easiest, but it's the next feasible way I can see it would be to do a crossing. Because um, for me, after the I did a ride, there's not much else. Well, there's plenty of things but as far as cold extreme environments that sort of thing like it's the south pole seems to be the next progression in that you know increasing difficulty challenge progressive exposure so i don't know i'll, I'll plan to go there yeah. and then if it comes off great if not that's fine because there's a lot of work to be done before that um yeah. so that'll just play off in the side and then i'll finish off my phd probably look at um doing a little bit more consulting around sort of um 
I don't know, like it's mindset resilience, but I hate those words. Like for me, they're just catch words that people don't really understand and they're used, mm. overused in marketing, much like, you know, core has been in the physical side of things for the last decade. So that's why yeah. I see those terms fitting in. Um, but I can sort of look at it around improving the human factors that uh, heavily, innov- or sorry, that undermine good culture sort of thing. So a lot of my stuff is actually change, culture change or culture development, trying to set the foundation for it to grow from. Um, so that, and then something I'd really like to do would be to develop my own performance facility for tactical and emergency services where, you know, you could use education, sort of bring them in for a week in sort of an, an environment where you go through all the education stuff, show them good recovery, show them, you know, good stress regulation techniques, a little bit of different stuff here and there, have people come in, present on different things and just kind of a, a central point to improve the outcomes in emergency and sort of critical response services. And ideally, if I could arrange it somehow, that would be a free to use thing. So there's a lot of a lot of work to be done into that space, but I think there's definite need for it. And I think um, it would be something that for me would be, you could go there to work every day, comfortable or happy with what you're doing sort of thing. So it'd be, you know, good balance between doing that and looking after the family and not sacrificing anything. Nice, nice, absolutely. It really is, I find so many of us are veterans no, that's incorrect. The veterans are, but all the guests that I've had on the show, we're just here to help others. We're here, there to, to teach, not tell. To, to, you know, Joe Dottori, uh, Professor Joe Dottori, uh, he's just proved through his studies that he can cure, that his modalities cured traumatic brain injury. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and I've tried to promote, promote a little bit. Um, anybody I've linked him up with, current Delta, current um, New Zealand uh, commandos that have got um, acute, like one guy just a strop let go while they're towing a vehicle last week and, and took him in the face. So he was in an induced coma. Uh, I just I just link him on email um, and straight away, he's like, yep, come over, I'll help you. I'll, I'll give those information. We're just here to help each other. And it's, uh, I love the openness that you've, you've shown today and what you said for your future endeavors is, is absolutely brilliant because Australia and New Zealand <laughs> is definitely lacking in comparison to say the States where, you know, SEAL Team 6 and Delta, they're the words that civilians will comprehend. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they get top of the line um, strength and conditioning coaches that, you know, Dr. Kirk Parsley has been on the show, top sleep doctor, former Navy SEAL, you know, he's, he's a, a sleep and hormone specialist helping those guys out and we're a bit behind the eight ball here. So I think uh, what you're doing is, is needed and, and it's great to see, uh, see it growing. It's, I'm honored to speak to you at this sort of start of your journey in, into the, the next uh, few decades of that as well, Dan. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, yeah. And I, there was a time, if you spoke to me a decade ago, I would have been literally all about myself. And I think a lot of people are, you just on this, I need to prove journey. And then I think you kind of, a lot of people get to a point where it's like, you know what, I'll just share everything I've got because the more I can help, the better it's going to be. So then, but I don't know, like it's, for some people you just get to a point, I think, where you decide that you don't need to just go out and find your own value. You can go and help. So I think so I'm at that point now where I've got past that, you know, pursuit of myself or my own self-indulgent things and just trying to get better information out there, which I think is why I went into the PhD. So yeah, anything I can share, I'm definitely interested in. Um, I'm interested in that. Uh, traumatic training or traumatic brain injury research so i know uh, the heavy weapons like the percussion blast from explosives breaching sleep deprivation um, is all a factor that shows up across special operations around sort of cognitive degeneration and disease later in life so i'll be curious to look into some of that but um yeah, it's a pleasure to come on and if there's anything i said that anyone's interested in i'm happy to share any of that research or information oh, thank you so much look i'll put everything in the show notes there um, for everybody to a- access you as well. Yeah, Dan, absolutely honoured to have you on the show, honoured to meet you. Um, I'll, I'll hit pause, we'll have a chat after, but thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Awesome.